Sport had made his book such a publishing sensation? Well, it was the it was the astonishment that people felt that they'd bought into the fairy tale, the 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 uh, questing Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, and the beautiful princess, and the Archbishop of Canterbury himself during their uh, wedding vows talked about this fairy tale, and it, it, in a curious way, it was a postmodern fairy tale because there was no happy ending, and I think that uh, and I think that that single issue propelled the book into international status. And, and also Diana herself turned single-handedly, turned the royal family into being what you might call a home counties monarchy into an international institution. You, um, I know, spent many, many days, weeks, listening to her voice, um, listening again and again to what she had to say on the tapes. Now, presumably you've had to go back and start that process again before the release of these latest tapes. Um, how did it feel? How did it feel to have that voice back in the room with you? It's quite eerie, to be honest with you, and and it's it, it can be quite unnerving, especially when you listen to parts where she talks about her ambition for the future is to, you know, just walk along a street in Paris. Well, we all know what happened. And some elements of it make the, the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Some of them, some of the, the things she says uh, are quite humorous. I mean, it's not all uh, doom and doom and gloom. It's 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 uh, uh, she didn't take herself too seriously. So you get a, a far more nuanced feeling of her character listening to the to her voice than perhaps you do with reading the words on a page. Well, we'll come to that uh, fateful weekend in a moment, but uh, you said she talked about her own hopes for the future. Had what happened not happened, what do you think she would have wanted for herself? Well, what she wanted was primarily for her sons, and this is the, what I find fascinating, that her ambition was to, was to see... Prince Charles, her, her uh, estranged husband, go off to Italy, as as she said, with his lady, meaning Camilla, and take up farming, sketching, and watercolours and the rest of it, and leave her to um, guide Prince William into his fu future destiny as king. That is to say, to jump a generation. Well, that never happened. But the, the, the other point she, she also made was uh, she saw... Um, Harry very much as a backup, as a wingman to William in the difficult, lonely job that he uh, will face. Well, that hasn't happened either. So you could say that, that, that her ambitions will have been thwarted by the effects of other decisions and, and by time. And I guess of her own passing, um, she herself obviously uh, was not there to try and make that vision a reality. And uh, we're talking this weekend about that moment. Now, in the car with her in Paris, of course, we know was Dodi Al-Fayed, whose father also passed this weekend. Um, can we talk for a moment about the Al-Fayeds? I, I know that you met Mohammed Al-Fayed. Uh, what, what kind of man was he? Well, I, I met him to, to inter interview him uh, at Harrods, and it's the only interview where I've actually turned the tape off because uh, his talk was so profoundly scatological and uh, the, the, littering the whole conversation with the f bomb, etc. That it just wasn't worthwhile. With hindsight, I should have actually taped the whole thing and then just printed it with with uh, asterisks. Um, but he, he he struck me as a man who was absolutely obsessed with the fact that he believed that Prince Philip and the Secret Service were behind the death of his son uh, and, and Diana. Um, but I got the sneaking feeling, really, that he was the man who made the final decision uh, when his son said, shall we go back to the flat and this is our plan, a decoy vehicle is to leave from the front of the Ritz and we'll leave from the back. He gave it the okay. So in the sliding doors moment, 
he 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 didn't say no just stay in the ritz hotel he said off you go and that fateful decision led as we know to the pond down the tunnel if i had had a, a sort of mission uh presumably people say he wanted to join the British establishment, but he also then loathed it because he felt it rejected him. Uh, so he started to play quite an outsized role in British politics as well. Looking back, what do you think his impact was? There are people today who work for him who say that actually, who are making the case that he was actually some kind of reformer because he blew the whistle on members of parliament who he had paid to ask questions? Well, I wouldn't say he was a re reformer. He was a very smart and shrewd businessman uh, beneath that uh, 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 kind of uh, cloak that he, that of, of, uh, of, of being a revolutionary, as it were. I, 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 th I think that he was desperate to be uh, accepted by the British establishment. Um, he sponsored, for example, the Windsor Horse Show and was pictured with the Queen. Uh, he supplied goods and services to Kensington Palace, to Buckingham Palace. So he was desperate to be accepted. And the, the, the fact that he was rejected by the establishment meant that they had a cool, cunning and clever, beneath all the bombast, uh, enemy. Uh, in in the the dark heart. You, of course, uh, Andrew, will always go down in history. Um, I think uh, Diana referred to you as the noted author and historian. Uh, you will go down in history as a man who changed the way we think about, the way we perceive the royal family. And you've been an observer of the institution for, well, decades now. Um, we're a year on Badly. now from the <laughs> we're a year on now from the accession of the new king how's he doing well it's very much business as usual i mean when you when you look at the accession of elizabeth ii it was seen as a new elizabethan age that um the the, the monarchy uh, would bring a, a sense of change and vibrancy to uh, uh, post-war britain it didn't happen but nonetheless that was the feeling uh, when prince Charles became king, it was very much seen as, you know, a familiar face, a safe pair of hands, uh, who's, who's uh, uh, continued to uh, do very much what he is, has been expected of him. Do you think that uh, the monarchy has any kind of future? Because lots of people talked a lot about, you know, this is the end of it when the late Queen passed, that this would be the beginning of the end for the institution. Um, but from what you're well, saying, you think it's pretty much going to be there for a while? I think it's going to be there for a while. I mean, the succession is assured. You've got William, you've, you've got George, and uh, so it, it will take it beyond our lifetimes. And um, and it's really, I always think it's a bit like changing your bank account. It's, it's, it's more trouble than it's worth to find something else. Um, and, you know, it, the monarchy goes through a series of cycles. It's a bit like the births, marriages and deaths columns of a local newspaper. The exciting part of when the, the children grow up, when they start dating, who they marry, who the children are going to be. Um, so we're in that lull now where the children are at school, they're, not, they're vaguely interesting, but not that interesting. They'll be, become more so. The, the interesting question is going to be how will... Meghan and Harry introduce Archie and Lilibet to their cousins and when, when and how will they uh, uh, get along because clearly their parents don't. Do you expect them ever to return to these shores, to Britain? What, and have Meghan Markle curtsying to Kate Middleton? Not, I, don't, I, don't think the, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't see that as a, as a, as a runner. Um, they've got their own lives in in California, they've got their own set, they've got their own influence, and they've got their own uh, uh, companies. So I guess in the end, um, what you are telling me is that you think the chances of reconciliation not, are never zero, but they are pretty slim. Yeah, I mean, the... the, the um, 
the first rule of royal reporting is never say never. So it, it could happen. But I don't see any reason why they should get together. And it's rather like the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. When they left Britain and went into exile, they made their own lives in France and in on the, on the east coast of America. And they made the occasional uh, foray into Britain. They stayed at the homes of friends or at hotels. And I think you'll see exactly the same with Meghan and Harry, that they'll stay at hotels, they'll stay with friends. They won't, they won't trouble the royal family. And um, as I say, the, the, the difficulty is going to be, how do you uh, make, fr make friends with your young cousins, with Archie and Lilibet, if you never see them? A story that's not going to go away, and I expect that you will be, as ever, in the forefront of reporting it. Andrew Morton, thank you very much. My pleasure.